Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Jennifer Lewis, the Executive Director of IBMA, and we're delighted to welcome you to this IBMA webinar on Bacillus thuringiensis, how to promote microorganisms and biocontrol, avoiding the unnecessary regulatory hurdles. Biocontrol is essential for Europe's Green Deal. Farmers need biocontrol products urgently. So a discussion on how to avoid unnecessary hurdles for Bacillus thuringiensis, BT, the most used microbial product worldwide, is indeed a very important discussion. Bacillus thuringiensis is relied on by farmers all over the world to produce residue-free fruit and vegetables. And we're therefore delighted to have such a wonderful panel of experts to talk to you today about BT. Let me introduce each of them briefly. Professor Ben Raymond, Professor of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Exeter in the UK. Ben has worked on Bacillus thuringiensis and its relatives since 2001. He has published 37 papers involving this organism alone, looking at resistance, virulence, genomics, and its fundamental ecology, as well as understanding what drives diversification and specialization within the Bacillus serous group. He did a PhD in York, followed by postdoctoral positions at Imperial, Royal Holloway, and Oxford University, and became a professor in Exeter in 2021. He has also been advising UK government on release of biological control agents as part of the ACRE committee since 2016. We also have our expert representatives from the Bacillus thuringiensis registrants, namely Dr. Jose Carvalho of Certis Biologicals, Certis Biologicals Europe Regulatory Affairs Lead, Ms. Karine Moray, Moray Grobo, Regulatory EU Team um, Coordinator for CBC BioGuard, and Ms. Maria Herrero, the Global Regulatory Affairs Director for Sumitomo Chemical Valent Biosciences. Let me also introduce Mr. Jeroen Meyerson, who has over 30 years of experience as a regulator in the Dutch National Regulatory Authority, CTGB, and in the European Commission. He was also head of the Minor Uses Coordination Facility and chair of the OECD Expert Group on Biopesticides. Jeroen is currently working as a consultant to IBMA. And we also have Mr. Frank Volk, Managing Director of BIOFA AG and a board member of IBMA Germany and Austria. Frank has first-hand experience of the needs of farmers of BT and the challenges of bringing biocontrol to market. I would like to thank all panelists for agreeing to share their insights with us. And I'm sure you will agree that this is an illustrious panel and we look forward to an exciting discussion. Without further ado, I will hand over the floor to the moderator, Mr. Pascal Michaud, Managing Partner of EU Focus, to introduce the webinar. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you very much, um, Jennifer. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you um, uh, and uh, uh, exchange in another uh, very challenging topic. Uh, we are extremely pleased uh, that IBMA decided to organize uh, such a very timely webinar on a topic of relevance to all of us. Um, we are already at the end of this commission term with just 18 months to go. Time flies. Basically, the Green Deal was the political driver of these past years. The farm to fork implemented uh, the principle within the food area. We basically are due to produce as much as we can, but with more organic or sustainable solutions. Organic agriculture is still somewhat marginal and farmers have difficulties to maintain a similar level of production. Of course, the war uh, initiated by Russia impacted substantially the cost of entrance, while inflation surged, reducing the capacity of consumers to buy quality food. 
Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT, is among the key biocontrol solutions on the market today. I think we can say, without BTs, it would be an illusion to believe that the 25% objective by 2030 will ever be close to reach. BTs and, in general, microorganisms like natural solutions are not considered under the Draft Sustainable Use Regulation as chemical substances or products. In fact, they are out of scope as regards the 50% volume reduction. And for one good reason, there is no risk to humans or to the environment. So, the current discussion in the scope path, and in particular in the residue scope path, one lead to confusion. Some seem to consider that a maximum residue limit, or MRL, is required, and some that a pre-harvest interval, or PHI, is therefore needed. Question is why? Well, because they believe that there might be a causality link between some slight food born sickness symptoms, symptomas, and BTs. Though this, this is not proven, the today society model that the perception of a risk is a risk in itself and therefore should be managed prevails over rationality. I also want to add that, for instance, for BC, we don't see any uh, maximum residue limit being considered. More and more, our society and decision makers seem to conclude that not a single risk is acceptable as regards food production and consumption. This, even though we fly, we drive every day. Tobacco and alcohol are widely available, even though the risk to consume those is widely known to be very high for your good health. The selectivity in our risk tolerance is, to say the least, surprising, and in this case, very much contradictory. At one time, we wish to promote biocontrol and natural solutions, but at the same time, we wish to restrict their use and send a message to the farming community that maybe a synthetic solution is exactly the same as a natural one. Why promoting then those in the draft sustainable use reduction, which is still far from being adopted, I, th I should underline, uh, why reducing uh, uh, the volume of synthetic solutions in that case? There is a sort of inconsistency here. It is clearly not appropriate in terms of, re of, term of management of the risk these obsession with a zero risk policy that investments are moving out of Europe. And therefore, the US is today, with Brazil, number one market for biocontrol and, in particular, VTs. This, whereas we pretend here in the EU that we are leading in terms of food quality and food safety. We are very proud of that. But I think this is debatable. And with this current management of the risk, the EU will slowly but surely lag behind the other regions of the world. At some point in Europe, and this is true for crop protection, for BTs, but for industrial chemicals or biocides, the risk is part of the society, a part of a society. It must be properly, properly assessed scientifically and objectively, and not based on emotion. Emotion should not drive decision how to live with a possible risk. 
First of all, is the risk really serious? Is there a causality link that can be proven? What are the downsides of relating a risk, which is, in this particular case, even if existing, very mild and, as I said, not even proven? Sorry. Not even proven. The precautionary principle should not lead to the EU society to inertia. Did we not take a risk with the COVID vaccine? Of course we did. And it paid off. Without risk, a society would not progress. In conclusion, let us remain open and, as I said again, objective, avoiding to turn our modern society into an obsession of control. With this provocative introduction, I'm very pleased to give the floor to the various members of the task force for a constructive exchange, I'm sure, on the negative impact and the clear, I want to insist, clear negative impact and unnecessary uh, uh, regulatory orders that would possibly uh, dramatically impact the uh, development of uh, natural solutions. Having said that, and in concluded, I want to give the floor to, uh, to the task force, um, which has uh, prepared a, a PowerPoint presentation to drive you to, uh, through the various slides unless uh, Ben would have reached us by now. So I don't know if I can be informed. Yes? Okay. So maybe we can then, then, then turn to you for the presentation. Floor is yours. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, hope you can all hear me well. I will try to share my presentation. Oh. It's already live. Okay, so uh, thanks for your presentation today. I'm just going to share a few thoughts um, that I've had on um, uh and food safety. Um, oh, can you do the next slide, please? Or, okay, so my um, interest in this area dates back to this um, publication by the EFSA Biohaz Biohazard Committee on Food Safety in BT. And um, this paper, um, in many ways, said a lot of things that I really vehemently disagreed with. And uh, in response, I published a rebuttal, if you could show the next slide, um, along with uh, Brian Federici, which has quite a hard-hitting title um, in defense of Bacillus thuringiensis, the safest and most successful microbial insecticide, etc. cetera. Um, and, um, and, and I'll take you through some of the points I made in this paper. Uh, and I would also say that um, in contrast to Brian, who's co-author on this paper, I have occasionally worked with um, biocontrol uh, and um, agritech industry, but my views are um, generally representative of the community. You can also go forwards um, and uh, a follow up paper to this article. Uh, I, I gathered the support of about 200 signatures, 200 more than 200 scientists who worked in the biocontrol community, which suggests that really my views on this topic are really broadly representative of people who work on BT. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, our next slide, please. So, um, in this original uh, EFSA opinion, they made a number of supposition, suppositions, which um, I kind of take issue with. First of all, they assume that Bacillus cereus, which we know causes uh, both severe and relatively mild food poisoning, is more or less the same. They argue that BT can be as dangerous as Bacillus cereus for humans. They argue that actually we don't know much about the safety of BT and there may be sort of cryptic unrecorded infections, even though the safety literature and a lot of studies have shown that it's um, no one has really successfully managed to infect a human or a mammal with a biopesticidal strain. They also argued that BT or some strains of BT have caused human infections and that BT is associated with diarrhea. And I'm going to take each of those points in turn. Okay, next slide, please. 
So this is what we thought about the Bacillus Sirius group. Just when I started working in the field over 20 years ago, um, we have a group of quite different microbes. At the top there is Bacillus anthracis. You may not be very familiar with this organism, but it is the very, very dangerous uh, bacterium that causes anthrax, which um, um, is uh, very, very obviously harmful to humans. If you get anthrax in your blood, you need, I think, intravenous antibiotics within about 24 hours or you're dead. That's basically how dangerous anthracis is. There's a range of other microbes um, with different forms, including Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, if you could do, if you move slides forward, please, twice, next slide, and again, which have these large crystal inclusion bodies. And it was known, uh, even in the late 90s, that strains that produce crytoxins, crytoxins are widely distributed across the group, although most of them are focused in one particular area. Okay, next slide, please. So, first of all, the other supposition that B series is the same. So we know in many ways that this is not true at all, and that the B series group is a diverse group of strains which are genetically and ecologically very heterogeneous. So there's very, very different ecologies within this group. Um, next slide, please. And just to give you an analogy, um, the way we define species within uh, bacteria is often based on how far apart genetically they are. So, for example, uh, a difference in uh, sort of a 5% of the DNA that make up a microbe is kind of normally thought of as sufficient as separating two species. And this is a similar kind of distance as we might use in mammals. So a nice example of this is there's only a 5% difference in the DNA of, for example, a domestic cat and also a tiger. And yet the threats both of these organisms pose to humans are radically different based on that relatively small amount of difference in the DNA sequence. And we use a similar amounts of genetic distance to separate um, bacterial species. Next slide, please. So here we go. This, this is now sort of more modern take um, published a couple of years ago on how we should subdivide groups in the Bacillus series. And you'll see in the top right, next to the tiger, this group called Bacillus mosaicus, which is now the kind of way people will define groups in that clade, if you like, that particular group. In red is Bacillus anthracis, this really dangerous pathogen of vertebrates and, and humans. And also, if you've got very good eyes, sequence type 26, which causes the potentially lethal emetic food poisoning. Quite far away, down below in the uh, in the B series, I put the picture of the domestic cats. This is where, if you could advance the slides, please, a couple of, again, and one more time. This is where we'll see in that purple circle all the biopesticide strains are in this quite tight uh, genetic unit, which is quite far away um, from the species that we know to be very, very dangerous to, um, to humans. And now, even if um, strains in that mosaicus group, the tigers, if you like, are found with crytoxins, we know um, uh, that this characteristic of BT can be found across the group, we would now, we can, we can, we would now put them into a into a different species okay next slide please okay and this is just a list of some of the work that's been done showing differences in ecology and biology between those major species or major clades in the b series group we know they have different ability to colonize plants we know they have different optimal growth temperatures their ability to grow in insects is different they carry different amounts of virulence genes um they replicate in the gut at different rates. And critically for this discussion, we know that their, to their basic toxicity to vertebrate cells is also different. And that varies between those species very, very strongly. And that also explains a lot of the safety testing, which shows that it's very, very hard for that concentrated group of uh, biopesticidal strains. Um, you know, they're in a group which we know to be um, much, much, much less dangerous um, than, for example, strains closely related to anthrax. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so another one of the points made by EFSA is that there may be evidence for sort of, uh, there may be sort of um, cryptic infections, BT and Bacillus cereus, um, very hard to tell apart on plates. You need more, much more sophisticated tests. Is there any, um, could we have possibly missed BT infections that have caused diarrhea in the past? So. 
Um, what's quite interesting about uh, certainly the one of the chairs of the, that EFSA committee um, actually um, is in charge of a database or helps set up a database which has data which can address this question. So this is a summarizes um, the results of a genotyping scheme which is specifically set up to associate disease with particular genotypes. And in those databases, they focus on um, all clinical isolates that have come from B-serious infections or B-serious group um, uh, diarrhea. And none of the diarrhea or serious clinical infections in that database have ever been associated with this set of genotypes, um, um, which are those, those associated with all the biopesticidal products. So in other words, um, lots and lots of infections have been genotyped um, and none of them have ever really matched the genotypes um, used in the biopesticide industry. So um, I think we can have a high level of confidence in that there are really, you know, there aren't really any of these cryptic infections or certainly um, very, very weak evidence. OK, next slide, please. OK, and go on. OK. Uh, Yes, can you go forwards? Okay, so another argument was that BT strains have been associated with acute human infection. And, and this again is quite a misleading statement and doesn't really reflect some of those points I made about how strains that we used to classify BT are now distributed across that whole bacillus serious group. There are some strains of of the B-serious group that produce crytoxin, so which in 20 years ago would have been defined as BT, that have been associated with quite severe infection. One of those is this odd little strain called concucian, which was an infection that happened in an individual that stepped on a landmine. And you can imagine that if you step on a landmine, your immune system is somewhat compromised. And yet, on top of that, um, this strain was genotyped, and it was shown to be very, very closely related indeed to, um, to bacillus anthracis, the causative agent of anthrax. So practically, um, you know, a, 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 the sister group, very, very closely related indeed. So again, this strain, though, in some definitions could be described as a BT. It's very, very distant related from any of the strains used in crops. OK, next slide. Finally, um, I think it was definitely misleading and incorrect of the ESSER opinion to state that BT is as dangerous as Bacillus serious senso stricto for humans. I mean, the, the safety data just do not support this statement. Um, um, doses of um, 100 million or uh, 100, uh, as high as 100 million BT spores are asymptomatic for vertebrates, and there are and there are a lot of other um, strains within the B serious group, B serious group, which are, are much, much more um, toxic. The most controversial claim, really, is that BT um, has been shown to be associated with diarrhea. I would say that an association with diarrhea means very little, as we know that BT is extremely widespread in food, um, not just. Um, from the presence of biopesticide spores, but because of the natural occurrence of BT on, on plants, we know the BT has a high prevalence in things like grain bins where there are insects around. Um, and so uh, food products based on wheat germ can have quite a high concentration of spores. And it's no surprise that if we eat BT spores that occasionally we will find it um, uh, in, 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 in fecal samples. Um, recent studies have again cost more kind of controversy on this issue, but all, for example, recent studies have done, for example, quite, um, now quite um, controversial study by Boney have uh, argued that BT um, was associated with diarrhea, but that study in its essence really only looks at food um, and the presence of bacillus in food. If we, if we know that, for example, um, BT is expected to be present on food, then it's no surprising, it's not a surprise that um, uh, BT is also found on the food of people who've had diarrhea. Um, to put this in another context, if we have a hypothesis, for example, that um, a common ingredient of food, such as bread, for example, is a causative agent of, 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 
of food poisoning. And it's no surprise to find a group of individuals who've had diarrhea who have also eaten something common like bread, um, if bread is very common in diets. What we really need is a proper study with a control group where people either have diarrhea or do not have diarrhea or eat bread or do not eat bread. And then we can interpret the results. A study which just says BT is widespread in food can't really enable us to draw um, conclusions about whether that's a causative agent of food poisoning. Okay, next slide. I think it's my last one. So just to sum up, um, Bacillus serious group is very, is very diverse. There are now um, subdivided into different species. Um, some groups such as the biopesticides, there's increasing evidence that these, these strains are really specialized strains that are, um, um, uh, that are, have many adaptions to feed on insects. Um, whereas human associated strains or emetic strains are now classified in a different group. And I would emphasize that no biopesticide genotypes have really been uh, recovered from serious clinical infections. And um, uh, even though they are still widespread in food, I'll be happy to take questions later. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, before we move uh, to, um, to our colleagues from the task force, maybe one or two questions already I wanted to ask you. Uh, how would you explain this, um, this um, I would say, behavior or this uh, conclusion from EFSA that BC egal BT? Because according to your presentation, uh, it's not at all the case, and the assessment should be a little bit, uh, a little bit more refined, as you rightly pointed out. So why, why EFSA is so, um, I wouldn't say superficial, but so uh, not so... Uh, detailed in its uh, in its assessment so are you saying why did the original review give an equivalence to yeah. bt and bacillus serious yeah um i don't i don't really know i think there's some i mean there is there is i mean one of the very very earliest papers on the taxonomy of this group argued that they were more or less the same, but now we're going back really to the early 1990s, uh, before the advent of genome sequencing, before even you know um, uh, you know DNA-based typing techniques, and that study has been overturned by every single DNA sequencing-based study since, um, and it was almost as if 25 years of data were ignored by that review. So, I mean, that was one of the reasons why the study did really upset me, because it's certainly true. Um, I suppose it's very easy to be confused about the classification of Bacillus thuringiensis, and certainly the taxonomy has been a mess, but we've all, we've known for a long time that Bacillus thuringiensis is diverse. We've known for a long time that the different clades have different um, properties and different risks. And we've also known that the biopesticide strains are in a very, you know, small section of that of that wider diversity. So um, I just think that that view is not a good representation of the evidence. Hmm. Maybe a, a, another one: um, the the Bacillus thuringiensis, so the microorganisms are, are present in the environment naturally. How can we distinguish, therefore, those from the commercial BTs and how a bony could make a link to, to any, uh, let's say, causality if it's not always clear if you can distinguish between commercial BTs and, and BTs so, naturally present? So uh, the, the bony paper, I mean, I don't have any issues with their methods and they did, manage, they used very detailed sequencing methods to identify biopesticide strains in food and this this is not in dispute but this is something we would expect at the beginning of the study that if you look for bt in food it, it's going to be there what what i really take issue with in that paper is the way they interpreted the data um at its most fundamental level that study sort of lacked a control group okay so in any observational study in any experiment we have a you know, we have, have a hypothesis, BT causes diarrhea. You would expect to have, say, a treatment where you have 
a comparison, you know, individuals that ate BT, individuals that didn't eat BT, or individuals that had diarrhea, or individuals that didn't have diarrhea. But all we have is the observation that people eat by pesticide strains. Um, and as I said, if you expect it to be prevalent in food, then, then, then you can't draw any conclusions from that. You know, as my old statistics professor said, no control, no conclusions. I mean, you really, you can't, you can't make any inferences about the causality. Uh, other things about the paper suggest, for example, I mean, the symptoms of food poisoning in that study don't really match to the kind of symptoms you, ex get, you expect from uh bacillus serious you know diarrheal food poisoning there's you know far too much vomiting there's not really you know so so uh you know you can distinct you can identify the bypasses for by pesticide strains now with 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 in-depth or genome focusing but as i said we expect we'd expect to see it in food Thank you. Thank you, Ben. So uh, I think uh, clear for, for this part of the discussion. We now move to the uh, presentation by the task force. So the task force has invested substantial, uh, substantial time and effort to provide a very strong data package for the uh, assessors to review, for EFSA to, to look at and for the scope have to, to discuss. Uh, we are now at a stage that the dossier is indeed in its final stage and decisions have to be made in particular regarding uh, this topic, uh, so maximum residue limit or, or time, time before harvesting or consumption. So these are the sensitive elements that we want to raise with you and explain uh, to the participants, to the 300 participants that are registered. And so I will give the floor maybe uh, to the first uh, in the team, Karen, to start with the uh, with the uh, with the slide presentation. Uh, thanks, Pascal. So good afternoon, everybody. So if we can move to slide number two, please. Thank you. So as already told by Jennifer uh, during the introduction. Uh, BT is essential to uh, for farm to for because uh, BT, commercial BTs um, have insecticide uh, protein, which are cry protein, which are biodegradable and highly selective to the target species, so high specificity of the target. Uh, this is also one of the most important insecticide used in organic agriculture. It is an essential tool. Uh, for caterpillar control uh, applied uh, close to harvest for, for the crops. And among the biologicals, it is uh, fast testing and it has a unique uh, mode of action uh, for managing the resistance to a shrinking toolbox of pesticide. For sure, it is not a, a chemical and it is uh, uh, also a product which is compatible with IPM strategy in reducing quantities of synthetic pesticide uh, which are applied for crop protection. Um, PT is uh, allowing farmers to contend with restricted numbers of chemical residues on products and also it uh, helps to meet the private standards of the grocery chain. Next slide, please. Um, BT, is a Sorry, BT is also uh, aligned with the draft to sir. For sure, it is not neither a chemical active substance nor a chemical plant protection product. But, and uh, as a microorganism, it, it is complying with the definition of the bio, what is a biocontrol. Uh, as in set in the, the sewer, a biocontrol, uh, um, a biological control means uh, uh, something to con which is uh, used to control organisms which are harmful to plants or to plant projects. Using natural means of biological origins or substances, substances which are identical to them. And uh, also, um, it is uh, useful for meeting uh, the objective um, of uh, the SUR. So, allowing farmers to have a sufficient tool for reducing their reliance on chemical plant protection projects and to have uh, these. Um, uh, sustainable tools, alternative tools, uh, the, their placing on the market should be eased. So um, this is one 
one for one point, uh, um, this bit is, is addressing uh, the goal and the objective of the sewer. Next slide, please. So, just uh, general words about uh, the biology of BTs. The strange uh, use in the commercial products containing BTs were selected because of their ecological niche as insect pathogens. They are highly specific. And thus, this makes them poorly adapted to, to multiply and to persist in the environment, including on foodstuff and in the human body. These BT strains. Uh, uh, are better adapted to complete their life in their host, insect host, than in other environments. Indeed, the germination of the Bt requires specific conditions, including specific nutrients and a pH of around 10. And uh, all these Bt have a specific mode of action and produce a protein which are called cry protein. And these proteins are specific from the different Bt strain. For example, BT um, subspecies Kostaki is producing cryprotein 1, which is uh, used to control um, Lepidopteran order. And this producing of um, the cryprotein is requiring to the microorganisms a great energy demand. Next slide, please. So for us, BT is very useful and is a low risk natural solution. BT is indigenous and uh, it can be found mostly everywhere. Uh, strains of BT have been isolated worldwide from many habitats, including soil, insects, stored product dust, and also on plant leaves. BT does not tend to germinate or multiply in the environment on, on fresh foods, as it is requiring a highly nutrient demand for germination and growth. And also, it is not tending to be competitive towards the microorganisms, even under the gross condition of Bacillus cereus. Next slide, please. And as I told uh, previously, and how it was told also by Ben, these uh, BT strains are highly specific to the host insects. So here you can see um, in, a, in a program uh, to control olive moss, this program was held in Spain last year, and this year the results of two programs, one being conventional and the second one being organic. And uh, are counted the beneficial insects within this program. And in the conventional programs where uh, chemicals insecticides were applied and uh, where also a BTK strain were used, you can see uh, that um, when for the insecticide which come from chemistry, uh, the number of beneficial insects is flat, whereas in the same conventional program it increased. Uh, but comparing the number of beneficials within these conventional programs to the organic programs, you can see that the number of beneficials is much lower. Indeed, in this um, in this uh, organic program, you see also that using um, BTK uh, in this uh, in this program is making increase the number of beneficial. Just to summarize in short words, that this uh, program show perfectly uh, that there is no harmful expect effects expected on no target organisms. Thank you. Next slide. I think it's uh, Maria. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, as Ben Raymond indicated, there have been two publications recently which have attempted to link BTUs to foodborne outbreaks. One of them is by Beagle um, et al., just published last year, where they uh, took fresh produce from Swiss grocery stores and um, looked for BC and BT. And 27 of those had uh, bacillus um, in them. 14 of those had BT, as you would expect, because a lot of the things that they looked at, like tomatoes and uh, baby spinach, et cetera, BT is used on them. 
the paper does contribute to the understanding that BT products are um, are and have been part of our daily lives for a long time because BTs have been used for over 50 years. Um, the attempt to connect uh, these strains to strains assumed to be the causative agent of earlier um, foodborne outbreaks is has some issues with it. The, the um, situation in Germany did have one of um, a BT in it, but also had other foods with Bacillus cereus in them. The Austrian samples did not really have any fresh produce in them. Um, two of the causative agents um, or foods were mashed potatoes and a pancake soup. The other was a beef ragu and really not um, yes, maybe a BT was found in there, but there was no actual link or proof that a BT was the agent. Next slide, please. Bonnet's paper also, if you looked at it, um, has been criticized for the uh, conclusions that it draws to. Um, Basically, where Bonnet started was from 250 um, outbreaks over a 10-year period, so 2007 to 2017, where they actually only took um, foodborne-associated BC collections uh, from the French collection. Out of those, um, BT were found um, in 49 of them, even though um, some of those cases were missing symptoms and incubation periods. So we really don't know very much about those uh, foodborne uh, situations. The total number of toxic episodes that were there that only had BT were found to be 19. And a total of episodes that where no vomiting took place were only six. And BT, um, as we will show you, we do not think will ever cause vomiting. We do not have the emitic toxin, which is known to cause the vomiting. And therefore, the high, it's highly unlikely that BT was um, a cause of those foodborne issues. Out of the total number of 250, there were only four with diarrhea. And out of those, there was only one that the timing to the foodborne um, episode actually coincides with how diarrheal BC is assumed to work. Next slide, please. So just you know to uh, indicate, we have submitted dossiers and strains have been shown not to be pathogenic or toxic to rats, to fish, to daphnia, to beneficial insects, to oysters, to birds, and long-term exposures of sheep. Um, understand that um, doing studies on humans is difficult. Um, it, and not to be done, um, but there are some very old studies which BT was fed uh, to humans with absolutely no uh, uh, food poisoning events. We do not have the serolite gene in any commercial BT. Uh, that is the heat-stable toxin, which can cause vomiting um, and causes short-term uh, food poisoning uh, possibilities. No diarrheal event has ever been conclusively proven to be from commercial BT applications, as I said, even after 50 years of use. And some strains have even been shown in the Beagle paper to have disruptions in the specific diarrheal um, genes, which prevents their expression. So again, highly unlikely that a BT would ever cause a diarrheal event. Next, strain, um, next uh, slide, please. So let's take a look at tomatoes for an example. Uh, Europeans eat, you know, five tomatoes a week. A significant portion of the tomatoes are grown in greenhouses. 
Tuta absoluta, an insect, loves ripening tomatoes and it's very difficult to control. And tomatoes are harvested daily. So the plant protection sprays and, and harvest happen concurrently. So you tend to have a, um, a harvest um, with a spray ha happening uh, very closely together. Fresh tomatoes make it to our table within a few days of harvest, ready to eat. Everyone assumes that it is good and healthy to eat tomatoes. And according to the weight of evidence and in infectious disease public uh, statistics, the chances of, of getting a BC diarrhea is much higher from eating spoiled starchy foods and meat than consuming any fresh vegetables. And this next slide will help uh, bring that message home. Uh, this is just to show you um, a greenhouse with tomatoes. You can see the ripening ones at the bottom and the green ones um, are still growing. And that's why you have to harvest and spray um, uh, in a continuous basis. Next one, please. So um, we were able to take from one of the EFSA surveillance studies um, the cases from France, because that is the country that has been um, reporting the highest level of BC supposed food poisoning cases and do a deep dive into what this data actually shows us. And um, most cases, um, as you can see here, um, where they indicated the Bacillus cereus was the first possible causative agent. We actually have a lot of Clostridium and Salmonella and, um, excuse me, staph toxins actually being found as a possible secondary causative agent. Um, it's not explained why one gets indicated as primary and the other one as secondary but you have a lot of cross-contamination with other um, uh, microbes. Most cases were not confirmed. Uh, the causative agent is actually determined from symptoms and not necessarily, um, it was only in food, the, uh, pa uh, the patients were not followed, et cetera. And at, the, at that time, French authorities did not actively test for other things like viruses. We now have a lot more testing directly of toxins rather than just the micro. Um, and we just feel that a lot of the cases that are being reported really have nothing to do with BT and much deeper dive needs to be done to cause um, to make us reach a conclusion. And I believe that's my last slide. Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. Um, I'll be looking in the next slides at what an unnecessary regulatory hurdle, um, what will be the impact, uh, previous slide, sorry, if I can. If you could move to the previous slide, thank you. Um, just to look at what will be the impact of, for example, implementing a PHI on the different strains of Bacillus thuringiensis in Europe. Um, that impact study has been run already uh, in Germany, where PHIs are in place now for many years and led to um, basically a stop in the use of PTs, particular for the vegetable sector. And what you can see on the left graph, you see BTs being reduced in just about two years of reporting. These are figures from the German authority, the VVL, based on quantities of the different um, four BT strains um, sales in Germany. So the volumes are in tons. You see a reduction of pretty much 50% in just two years based on the data from December 2022. And at the same time, just by selecting four insecticides candidates for substitution, you will see the quantities um, doubling, almost doubling in the, um, in the same uh, period of time. Just to mention that the 
the France implements some default PHI of three days more recently, um, and it's still to see the impact of that um, measure. So as a summary, we see um, for the rest of Europe um, a reduction of the BT year on year once the PHIs are um, implemented. And of course, the growers will have to use the alternatives, which in this case are the common synthetic um, insecticides. So um, looking at the German case and knowing that Germany is not one of the main producers of uh, fruits um, and vegetables in Europe, if you look at the main producers um, and the use of BT in Europe, which is driven by uh, mainly Italy, but also um, Spain and also the Netherlands, um, we still don't have data for 2021. Um, and in the Netherlands, we'll have a continuous growing system. So we, we need to look at the data a bit differently. But there you will see how BT is being used um, in the world and the contribution from um, the BT uh, uses in Italy and Spain are significant, are significant uh, considering the rest uh, of the world. If we look just at Europe, we see on the um, or European Union member states, you see on the left uh, the contributions of these two countries, um, which we know are producing a lot of the... Um, fruits and vegetables for the rest of Europe, but also we see an increase in Poland, mainly due to the palm fruit and the shift Poland is operating to move into biocontrol technologies. So where BT is being used, on the left, uh, you will see um, where BT is being used in the world. The China is excluding because it will be start, uh, will be start um, the picture, it's the number one country using BT at the moment. But then all the other countries um, and the crop segments, excluding soybean and cotton, because they're not uh, crops um, we cultivate in large extension in Europe, you see that the fruits and vegetables um, are really, together with the grapevines, are really the main uses of BT. And there you will see on the right, um, Italy, Spain, still missing the, uh, the data on grapevines, but also Poland on um, uh, palm fruit. You will see there are the major contributors for um, the uses of PT in Europe. And you see, for example, in Germany, we don't have any records in terms of market marketing uh, of the use on, um, on vegetables. So as a summary, uh, we have already an impact assessment of what will be the impact on the growing of fruits and vegetables for the, um, the rest of Europe. Um, Germany has already PHIs in place for BTs with direct consequences, which is basically the growers stop using and revert to candidates for substitution. Three countries um, are very important for the production of fresh vegetables um, in Europe and their growers there um, will be directly impacted by these BT restrictions together um, with Poland in terms of the palm fruit. And this is in terms of volumes um, of BT use, but if we look at countries like the Nordics, which have been shifting to biocontrol and alternatives at a, fa a faster pace, then we will have a much higher impact in terms of their growers, uh, because some of the chemical alternatives have been phased out and also delivering the wrong message to countries like Poland and more recently Romania, um, which authorities are actively trying to get more biocontrol solutions into their growers' hands. So what we retain from today, um, so BT is essential for the sustainable agriculture and is important not only for organic pharma, farming, but also for conventional in terms of breaking uh, resistance and use in conventional programs and up until the harvest of the, um, of the crops. Without BT, there'll be no farm to fork um, being delivered. BT is the leading uh, natural insecticide uh, worldwide and in Europe. There are studies available for more than 80 years of use uh, where 100 people have been directly exposed and this weight of evidence must be considered when looking at PT safety. The implementation of PHI, it's 
should be required when there's a toxicity established and not based on some speculative data on foodborne outbreaks, which cannot be attributed to an established cost and based on science and microbiology. The proof of causality link um, is required. And last but not the least, uh, imposing unnecessary PHIs will affect and reduce the availability of fresh fruits and vegetables treated with uh, biocontrol solutions. And we will need to ask uh, from where are we getting our fruits and vegetables in Europe and which message are we giving to the EU citizens and the EU growers in terms of delivering the green deal, the farm to fork in the current um, EU um, policies to lead the rest of the world in terms of crop uh, protection and growing using more sustainable agriculture solutions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jose, and uh, and the team for a very convincing uh, uh, <clears throat> presentation about the importance of BT and the uh, misperception behind the, any the, the risk that are being advanced by by some in the, in Scopa for uh, some uh, some agencies like uh, like EFSA without any any actual uh, proof of any risk. So uh, before we go into um, a couple of questions, um, Frank, uh, you are a user of uh, of these uh, products. So I think we want to we would be interested to hear what's the market, what's the market for the BTS, uh, how you see the development of BTS indeed in Germany, because as explained by Jose, there was a drop after the a PHI was set. How how you see the development of the market and and the risk linked to this discussion that we are having today and can we really say that uh, uh, there would be a, a risk that uh, we don't meet the, the farm to form of objectives if, if there is a confusing message, I think that's the word, to the farming community. I mean, I heard many times from scope of authorities if we want to have biocontrol or natural solutions used by farmers, they need to have a clear-cut story. If they have a feeling that there is any restriction, or it's not a clear-cut story, why, why they should turn to, to biocontrol and not keep going with synthetic, which most of the time are less expensive. So, yeah, maybe a market, um, a market vision from you, Frank, would be nice, uh, nice to have to close the loop. Yes, yes, there is certainly an impact and uh, an influence on the market. We, from Biofa, we've been selling commercial PT strains products for more than 20 years. And during all these years, we only know one case of foodborne outbreak, which is suspected to be caused by a salad treated with a commercial PT strain. And this special case happened in a, let's say, in a in a bad time, it had a real bad timing. It was at a time when there was a year or two years after the EA crisis, and Germany, German authorities were very, 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 very afraid to, to, to have another food scandal directory, directly after this crisis. And this special case, uh, we, we've been involved right from the beginning in all steps by the, by the German authorities. And we always expressed our doubts to the supposed proof of the case. But German authorities didn't hear. They just, yeah, they were afraid of the crisis, of, of another scandal. And um, this, let's say, and for the, against this background, the German authorities decided to set a PHI in the first case uh, to uh, to um, uh, crops produced in greenhouses. And in Germany, we had a combination of this uh, setting the PHI and uh, the German uh, uh, association DGHM, which um, which less issues issues. A micro biological limits in this special case for for fresh cut salads they uh, they set a, a, a limit for 10 to the th to the third of PCs for uh, uh, for fresh cut salads and this combination of this PHI and and um, and this uh, new limit uh, issued by DGM we had an enormous loss and the, the um, the, the figures Crusade told us that's been yeah uh, even a couple of years after 
uh, after this uh, this first set of the PHI, and the loss was was even more. We had a huge uh, sales in vegetables. It was commonly spread. And in uh, was included BT was included in any spraying strategy from from recommended by all by the complete uh, processing industry for for salads. And after this this case and the consequences, uh, we lost this complete market. And we've been working together with the processing food industry and food chains as they feel insecure to get back to this success we had in the past. And what we've learned in the past, we had a we have, have a strong close collaboration with these companies, and we've run many many trials. And maybe in a nutshell, uh, PC contaminations are in the majority of cases caused by natural background levels, PC from the soil, and uh, we've realized that all analysis results done by the food chain and by food control exceeding 10 to the fifth on BC are on vegetables grown near the near to the ground so natural background levels of of BC are more in, important like the timing of the BT application on 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 residues caused by a BT application with these facts it was possible and this possible to convince processing industry to allow and to recommend the use of, of commercial PT strains again in their spraying strategies. But when we are faced right now to new PHIs and to, to new restrictions, we will again lose all what we've done and our investment in the market will be for nothing. But why, 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 in fact, uh, so your customers, the farmers, why they switch so quickly to, I would assume, a synthetic solution? Why do they switch so quickly because there is a, a PHI? I think that, that, that would be good to know for, for all participants because there is, seems to be a very quick move from a natural solution to the conventional solution. If, there is, if the, the advantage which is supposed to be linked to the to the natural solution is gone. How you explain that? I, I, I in our experience, it is <clears throat> as the clear um, residue, clear residue situation. If you have a an, 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 a product which is um, uh, supposed to be residue fee, to have no residue limit set. Um, it was used widely used, and if this, if the, the the situation is unclear, if the if the the food processing industry feels insecure, they will get back to a product uh, which they have a clear situation, a clear calculation, and the impact on BC itself, not on the commercial BT strain, but on the impact on any possible BC strain causes an insecurity, which may which led to the fact that growers are using chemicals, which they can calculate. Okay, so 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 basically, you would say um, the farmer, as as soon as uh, he basically has to match uh, an MRL or a PHI. He will likely go to what is the clear scenario, given the fact that it is admitted there is eventually a toxicity point, and uh, at the end he will then choose the most uh, cost cost benefit solution and uh, eventually the most uh, quickest, uh, most uh, quickest efficient uh, uh, solution. Is that what I understand and from from your explanation? It will, agree, it, yes. it will not make a difference any, anymore between uh, well, I go organic because I want to promote a farm to fork. I just go uh, to what is the easiest and uh, fastest and most efficient for my for my crops. That's basically yeah, uh, the conclusion. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, this is the conclusion as the green solution, the the, the biological solution uh, has. As an, an uncertainty in it, and the chemical solution is easier for the farmer to handle. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Yeah, because farmers are used, of, of course, to, to, to deal with crop protection solutions. So they know what to do. They know how to report and control if there is a maximum uh, residue limit or PHI. This is something they are familiar with. So as, lo as soon as they lose the advantage of having no reporting to do, uh, etc., then they will they will turn automatically to what they know what they know best. Basically, that's the point. So, uh, uh, is this is this is this something that was raised with the German authorities? The fact that there is a drop in biocontrol solution because of this, I would call it unnecessary uh, regulatory uh, restrictions. And this precautionary approach supported by Germany, of course, they introduced the precautionary approach in the past. It's an excessive interpretation of a, of a risk or perception of a risk. You mean it's raised by the German authorities as a problem or uh, sorry for, for... No, no. What I, what I mean is that the, this situation um, that you experience, have you discussed it with the German authorities? Because at the end, the Germans have been behind the precautionary principle, and they seem to be um, extreme in the use they make of it. Uh, they don't take into account the consequences and the fact that um, a risk, in this case, if there is a risk, is a very minimum risk. Uh, and therefore, the the the, um, the decision they have taken will have a, a much more uh, a, a, a much more substantial impact that would be detrimental to the environment and and probably human health than should they have uh, maintained a no a no uh, MRL situation or no PHI. Yes, we from as as a company as well as we from IBM Germany um, got the. Uh, discussed it several times with the German authorities and we are and they are not open to discuss even not open to discuss scientific uh, arguments and we think we keep on tilting at windmills okay okay so uh, I have still a few questions here but uh, I would like first to hear what uh, Jeroen will tell us uh, Jeroen you have been a uh, an observer and an actor of the EU uh, approval system of pesticides for many years. I had the chance to meet you when you were at CTGB and then uh, when you were at COPAF. So you have experience of all these very nice houses of debate. Uh, so um, what do you want to tell us? Uh, well, what do you see here in the, with this case, which seems to be quite extreme in terms of uh, positioning of, of some uh, decision makers with respect to a risk which actually is not proven, uh, is not a major one and does not lead to anything but just a sickness if uh, there is even uh, if there is a, a causality link uh, proven. So what, what would you say? Uh, because your colleagues in Scopaf seems to have difficulties to come to a conclusion uh, so, what's your what's your advice? <laughs> yeah, thank you, um, uh, uh, Pascal. I can then uh, first give you the statement on behalf of IBMA, and then later on in the discussion, uh, we can uh, maybe address some uh, additional questions. Um, IBMA is of the opinion that setting MRLs for BT and for microbials in general is not appropriate, and I will explain you why. BT and other microbials are regulated for crop protection purposes under the PPP regulation 1107. Uh, the purpose of this regulation is, and I quote, to ensure a high level of protection of both human and animal health and the environment, and at the same time to safeguard the competitiveness of community agriculture." End of quote. These principles apply to conventional plant protection products, as well as to biocontrol products. And I want to emphasize that in the regulation, it is stated that the purpose is to ensure a high level of protection and not an absolute 100% level of protection, as this would have been an unrealistic requirement. 
Of course, IBMA fully supports the principle of a high level of protection as required by the legislation. The other aspect that is mentioned in the regulation is to safeguard the competitiveness of community agriculture. One of the aspects to consider for registration of any plant protection product is the level of residues. Maximum residue levels are firstly set to ensure free movement of goods, uh, secondly to ensure equal competition conditions among the member states and non-EU commercial partners, and thirdly to ensure a high level of consumer protection. I want to emphasize that approved microbials are not pathogenic to humans and therefore are exempted from MRL tolerances. Despite their strong safety profile and long-standing safe use, the safety of the BT-based biocontrol products is being called into question because of Bacillus series, a different naturally occurring microorganism where some strains can be opportunistic foodborne pathogens. Setting specific MRLs and proposing pre-harvest intervals for BT strains would be inappropriate and not scientifically justified, as we just have heard. While setting uh, specific MRLs would create considerable negative consequences for EU farmers and particularly for organic agriculture. The first aim of MRL is to check if the good agricultural practices have been followed by the farmer when applying the product. MRLs are trade standards and should not be used as safety limits. Signaling to the food value chain and the consumer that the product is not safe by setting PHI and eventually MRLs will set EU growers into a competitive disadvantage position without enhancing safety standards. But we should also look at the bigger picture. The Commission has launched green initiatives promoting the growth of a healthy crop system with a reduced use of conventional chemical pesticides and encouraging the use of non-chemical methods. The use of biocontrol products is a major contributor to the goals of the farm to fork strategy and the Green Deal. The availability of biocontrol products, and particular BT, is essential to meet the targets as set by the EU Commission regarding chemicals dependency reduction of 50% by 2030. If we look now at the EU pesticides database, we see that there are currently 455 substances approved. Uh, of this total number, there are 75 approved microbials, of which there are 10 different strains of, Bi of BT. However, we should not only look at the number of approved BT strains, but also at their market share. PTs are broadly used on a global level, and the uh, microbial global market is 500 million US dollars, of which 40% is BT, that equals with a market share of 200 million US dollars. So we can conclude that BT represents a considerable part of available biocontrol solutions. If you look at the draft sustainable use regulation, the SIR, IBMA welcomes the recognition of biocontrol as a specific form of plant protection through an EU definition of biological control. This definition encompasses microbials, including BT. In the SIR, it's also indicated that member states should take steps to remove to remove obstacles to biocontrol. By setting MRLs and PHI for BT, 
member states are adding additional obstacles to biocontrol instead of removing these. The SIR acknowledges biocontrol as an important tool to meet the reduction targets, and one should realize that microbials and BT are exempted from these reduction targets that are set for chemicals. The new data requirements for microbials became applicable last November. And if you look at these data requirements, we notice a change in the approach taken by the Commission. Biology and ecology are considered the basis for the risk assessment decisions. And the Commission has introduced the weight of evidence approach to address toxicity and pathogenicity endpoints. As is stated in the new data requirements, and I quote, in order to allow a proper assessment of the risk to consumers, a weight of evidence approach shall be employed, end of quote. These revised data requirements are crucial to the farm to fork initiative for the transition to a sustainable agriculture not only for the delivery of new solutions to the farmers, but also for keeping existing BT solutions on the market. Taking all the, the above mentioned elements into, consider, into consideration, and based on the available scientific information that just was uh, presented, IBMA is of the opinion that Commercial BT strains should be exempted from MRL tolerances as well as PHIs. Such a constructive way forward would provide a real opportunity for the EU Commission and the Member States to step closer to fulfilling the engagements taken within the umbrella of the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy by providing safe and sustainable solutions that match the needs and demands from society. Thank you. Thank you, Jeroen. Uh, a very clear statement from IBMA, and I think um, a, good, a good point uh, for uh, our conclusion. One question I still have maybe for, um, for the task force. Will we be in a position to keep growing uh, fresh produce in the years to come without BT if there is uh, therefore a restriction uh, with a PHI? Uh, are we likely to see a drop, a drastic drop with fresh uh, fruit and vegetable? Uh, is it going to be the case in every part of Europe, you think? And is this then a possible situation that uh, the companies will decide to focus on other parts of the world where there is a greater demand for, for BT solutions. And that would be a, a little bit of a uh, yeah, cynical situation that in Europe we promote, we promote, we promote the Green Deal and at the end we lose the solutions that would be in line with the Green Deal objective and, and it's the others that we tend to always criticize in Europe, like Brazil or the US, that would benefit from the most uh, advanced uh, sustainable solutions. What, what, what would you say, Jose, for instance? Yeah, I think, it, yeah, just to, if we look at European conditions and for example, particularly the Netherlands with a continuous growing system, we will see immediately an issue if a PHI is being implemented. So I think the first one we will see is regarding the Netherlands, but also the countries producing this, um, these vegetables. Um, and this will impact really the European growers, because if we look at the rest of the world um, without such restrictions being implemented, the growers in other countries, they will be able still to use the technology. And I think the overall question is what do we want, um, what are the technologies we want in Europe to grow um, our crops? And as you mentioned, it's, if we look at bigger markets, um, not only the US, but Brazil doing the transition, we do see in terms of you know, market value, it's huge because the BTs are being used you know, across not only for the fruits and vegetable market, but really in um, what we call the field crops or raw crops, if you want to. 
Um, and I think we are still not there um, in Europe. And given the message now on BTs, I think it will lead the whole biocontrol industry to revise um, the access into the European market. So it's clear that if we want to keep promoting and developing the production of fresh fruit and vegetable in Europe, we need to rely on solutions like the BTs. Otherwise, we will ex import more and more from third countries. And uh, the whole debate about being uh, independent and having a sort of sovereign food production status in the EU would go away. That's basically what I take as a, as a, as a point regarding the market. As we are getting closer to the end, um, what I want to say is that what I, what I take from, from this discussion is basically, and what I feel since years, is basically that we are moving more and more towards a society which does not accept the uncertainty. And I think that's, that's a risk for the society. Uh, we seem to be willing to explain every single possibility uh, of, uh, of uh, uncertainty, uh, even though we don't have the data. Uh, we seem to be willing to be reassured of, uh, about every possible risk, even when the risk does not lead to any major consequence. And that's a bit what we seem to be exploring uh, and experiencing now since, um, I would say, 10 years, where we move more and more towards uh, an acceptability of, of risk and risk managers do not want to take any more their responsibility when they are not convinced that they can exclude the risk and move to a risk zero situation. This is a bit uh, a sort of a um, feel liable uh, society or feel responsible society where we all uh, believe that uh, we should avoid that uh, anybody else, uh, anybody in general in society suffer from uh, even in a single, a single virus with no possible uh, major health consequences. Um, this policy that we seem to be having more and more with DG Santé and with some decision makers in member states will basically lead us to having to import more and more fruit and veg from third countries. We have seen that we have lost our independence now since a couple of years on quite a few crops and the war in Ukraine uh, reaffirmed the fact that uh, for some uh, major crops we are really dependent and uh, very, uh, it's going to be very difficult to, to change that situation that is uh, the one that we have now. Uh, if we keep going with this sort of uh, principles that we have to have no risk uh, fruit and veg will, will, will be coming from all over the world and uh, nobody will uh, uh, grow them anymore in Europe because of the cost uh, and, uh, and the uncertainty uh, when it has to reach the market. I think there is also a, a, a risk that some uh, food players increase uh, and uh, introduce their uh, double standards which would come up on both standards which are already set uh, by the EU authorities and which are already considered extreme. At the end, uh, who's going to be the, the first victim of all this uh, confusing situation is the farmer. The farmer wants simplicity. Each time we discuss with farming organization in, uh, in the member state in Eastern Europe or Southern Europe, they want simplicity and they want facts uh, and, and clarity. If uh, what, what is being sold to them, a very nice story about biocontrol and sustainable agriculture is actually always full of restrictions, uncertainties, the farmer will never want to change uh, its, its practices. It will always return to what he feels is safe and what he feels he knows best. And so we will move away from the objective of the Green Deal and the farm to fork, and we will have always the same solutions, which will be on, uh, on our, our, our Euro European soils and crops. So I think uh, from this meeting today, what I, what I draw as a conclusion is that decision makers should be wise, understand the consequences of their decisions uh, when there is an absolute uh, um, impossibility to determine with certainty whether there is a causality link and when 
The consequence of that certainty is a very mild sickness. I don't think a, a decision uh, in terms of risk management should be to, to impact substantially the perception of the importance and the uh, and the strength of biocontrol solutions, because that's also very sensitive. And once the perception has changed, uh, it will be extremely difficult to rebuild uh, the trust into, uh, into solutions. So I think that's a point for SCOPAF uh, representatives to think of. It was clearly said today that uh, there is no need to set uh, a PHI. There is no need to set an MRL because there is no toxicity established. The, B the BTs can be used very safely. Uh, they are natural microorganisms, which are anyway very present on the environment. They have been used forever. The French Bonny study has only managed to show that in one case out of, I think, 250, over, the year, over many years, uh, there might be a coincidence for the other cases. They were incapable <coughs> of demon this demonstrating a single causality link since they could not exclude the presence of other causes, uh, other viruses, which had not been explored to the same extent. So with that, um, I want to say that uh, we hope uh, that this webinar has uh, clarified uh, some of the scientific aspects between BC and BC. Uh, the assessment that we have made about Bonnie and Deagle, these two studies that come back really regularly in discussion, and that uh, we hope, like uh, uh, the rapporteur of these uh, BTs have said, that uh, there is no need for, for MRL, for PHI, and that uh, these BTs should be in the annex uh, where there is no uh, MRL required. If there is a need for further research, uh, further research can always be discussed uh, with the appropriate agencies, whether it's EFSA or the uh, bodies, uh, eventually at international level to m improve our understanding of the of microorganisms. But that should be for the future and not, should not be for the current uh, reapproval of the BTs, which should take place now in the course of this year. With that, um, I would like to thank uh, um, IBMA uh, for having hosted this uh, uh, great webinar and uh, all our speakers. Um, I think uh, we covered all possible aspects of the issue and uh, the fact that we have reached about 300 participants mean that it was very a very interesting topic and uh, we hope for the best and we may uh, of course have uh, other events uh, if, uh, if uh, required in the coming months. Thank you very much and have uh, a good evening to all.